Hello, and welcome to another virtual author chat at the Poison Pen Bookstore. I'm John Charles, and today the Poison Pen is delighted to have with us two talented authors, Ellen Byron and Marjorie McCown. Before we begin, for those tuning in virtually, the Poison Pen does have copies of both authors, both of the authors' books, and we would be happy to hold one or more for you or put them in the mail. Just give us a call or go online to the Poison Pen Bookstore. Now I'd like to welcome Ellen and Marjorie. Hello. Hello, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. My first question for both of you is I'm always fascinated as a reader as to how an author gets to where they're at, because there's always a backstory to their life. And both of you have some rather interesting career resumes. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself before you became a published writer? Why don't we start with you, Marjorie? Oh, okay. Um, I was a costume designer for my entire professional life. I started out in theater and opera, and then I switched over to film in 1990, moved out to Los Angeles, started working in film. And that's where I spent the rest of my career. I spent 27 years um, working in feature films in the costume departments, both as a costume designer, assistant costume designer, and key costumer. So I've, I've done the gamut. <laughs> um, and I've worked on a, a range of movies, everything from period and fantasy to a little bit of contemporary, which was not my favorite. Um, and I ended up mostly in the uh, superhero realm before I retired in 2017. What about you, Ellen? Uh, well, it's so funny. I didn't realize you retired in 2017 because that's actually when my last TV job ended. <laughs> and uh i haven't had another ah! one <laughs> it's completely I, i'll never oh forget i was um i had been writing on i'm i was a tv writer for years i actually started as a playwright and uh freelance entertainment journalist and then i transitioned into writing for tv and some of the shows you would have heard of would be wings and just shoot me and then i was working in animation on fairly odd parents and another uh, animated series and i remember i I was at Malice and I was listening to the historical panel when I got a text. The show was canceled. And um, oh. <laughs> I still remember where oh. I was. So, uh, but it was okay because I, I, my mystery career started to take off. And um, I, uh, I've i been incredibly happy ever since. So, <laughs> Although it was a really great experience. And um, yeah, Marjorie and I share and commiserate about our mutual Hollywood backgrounds, <laughs> different departments, but same surus. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yes. Yes. When did you decide that you wanted to write mysteries? And why don't we start with you, Ellen? Well, you know, I've always loved them. I mean, I found, discovered, of course, Nancy Drew, like everybody else. And then I discovered when I was a teenager, I discovered Agatha Christie. And, you know, I loved just hanging out in St. Mary Mead. I was a big Anglophile, so so all her settings mm. really appealed to me. And um, I, I actually wanted to write, at first, uh, the first time I thought I'd try writing mystery was in 1999, and I I was motivated because I wanted to kill a writer who had I'd worked with on, <laughs> who ended up I wrote with a TV writing partner, and this particular writer backstabbed us, and and I really wanted to get revenge, um, and <laughs> what I wrote was was um, cathartic but not very good. So um, so then I didn't really try again until. Uh, 2010 or 11 when I was not uh, I was between jobs uh, and so uh, my friend started a small writers group and I thought well you know what I've always I love reading mysteries I really want to try writing one and um, and that first book won uh, the Malice Domestic Grant for Unpublished uh, William F. Deke Malice Domestic Grant for Unpublished Writers uh, but it wasn't it didn't get it sold. It took me nine months. I did find an agent. He couldn't sell it. But while he was trying to sell it, I wrote Plantation Shutters, which became my first Cajun country mystery. What about you, Marjorie? Because if I understand correctly, your first attempt at mysteries is not what we got as readers today. Um, that's right. I you know it's interesting that um Ellen and I had uh very similar motivations for writing our first <laughs> books. Mine was a teeny little book that I, I really wrote between movies. And it was completely, you know, the revenge catharsis to kill a costume designer. <laughs> <laughs> that was a bad actor in many ways. Um, and I bonged her over the head with her Emmy statuette. That's how she ah! died. 
I didn't know we shared that in common. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That was, and that book was like 25 years ago. And um, it, it, my brother actually got it published through a small press and it was an event. It, well, I don't know. It was, we didn't get any advance for it. We didn't have to pay to have it published, but it wasn't anything like a real professional situation, but uh, it was fun. And um, uh, get, it, I had wanted to be a writer since I was a kid, but I never had the nerve to try and make a living at it. Um, and mysteries, I would say, well, I've always, I, again, Nancy Drew, Hardy Boys, when I was younger, um, but I've always been an avid reader. I didn't really come back to mysteries until I started working in film. And I became obsessed with mysteries because I found that was the only way if I was reading a good murder mystery at night, that was TV wouldn't do it. Other books that I loved wouldn't do it, but a murder mystery could shut off my brain after a long day on a film set. And I could forget about work and dive into the puzzle and the mystery. And that would, you know, click off my brain so I could relax and go to sleep. So I read hundreds probably thousands of mysteries um, while I was working in film. And um, I also had the idea that I, when I started thinking about, again, about writing a mystery, um, I thought that a big movie would be the perfect setting for a murder mystery because a movie company, especially a cozy mystery, a movie company really is its own microcosm of community its own set of relationships and there's always even more drama going on behind the scenes than there is on the screen so it just um it became uh i also needed a little bit of convincing for my literary agent because i wasn't sure when i first started writing at the end of my film career that i wanted to dive right back into the movies but she convinced me to do it and it just it all came together Okay, let's talk about the book that brought you here today. Marjorie, in your case, is the second in your series. What can you tell us about? Yes. The book is Starstruck, and it's the second in my Hollywood mystery series featuring key costumer Joey Jessup. And um, in this book, Joey is working on a big movie set in the golden age of Hollywood in the 1930s. Uh, even though the book is contemporary. And um, the leading lady for the film is a woman called Jillian Best, and she's um, a fading beauty. She's still a star, but she's also very invested both economically and energetically in launching a big lifestyle brand because she's hoping after her screen career is over, which is going to be pretty soon, um, that she's going to become a global entrepreneur in the mold of uh, Gwyneth Paltrow and Rihanna and, and those ladies who've made such a success of it. Anyway, um, there is a one night just before shooting, they're, they're shooting in downtown Los Angeles at a landmark hotel called the AS Hotel, which is a location used by many films that are set in the 1920s and 30s because it was one of those old movie palaces that's been, there's an old movie palace adjacent to the Ace Hotel that's been restored to its former glory. Anyway, they're shooting down there and on Broadway, there is um, a fatal traffic accident right next to the movie set. And Joey realizes at one point as they're beginning the accident investigation that the car involved in the accident actually belongs to Jillian. So she automatically becomes suspicious that there's something going on. And then when Jillian's personal assistant confronts Jillian on the set and vows revenge against her and ends up dead a few days later, Joey decides she needs to get to the bottom of whatever's happening with the leading lady. What about you, Ellen? Because you're kind of between projects. You had something come out in March, I believe, under your 
ultra literary ego and you have something coming for us in July. Yeah, this is a crazy year because uh, I had three books come out. Um, one uh, was the Witless Protection Program, which was the fifth and final book. And thank you. And the Catering Hall Mystery oh, Series. Oh. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I'm a huge fan of your series. You know that. I love it. Um, and uh, it was really fun. I, I just went, you know, B-A-L-L-S out and just, just <laughs> I don't know, and just had a blast. And, um, and so, so that finished. And then I, the first series in my um, new golden, the first book in my new golden motel mysteries, uh, which is backwards. That's so funny. It's backwards. A very woodsy murder. You'll have to hold this, uh, your computer up to the it mirror. Actually, it actually <laughs> looks fine on my oh, screen. Oh, okay. Good, good, I good, can't good. wait for this book. Yeah. It, that launches, uh, july 23rd although it's available for pre-order right here and all my books are available and then um the third uh vintage cookbook mystery french quarter fright night which is about uh how it involves halloween in new orleans and my my vintage bookstore um that will come out september 3rd through a new publisher severn house um uh, but um, I'll talk a little about, uh, I had a great time. If you like the Catering Hall Mystery Series, and even if you didn't, I think you'll really enjoy the Witless Protection oh. Program. It's just a fun read. I'm a, a proud beach read. I like to say uh, I can get you from LAX to JFK. You know, my books <laughs> <laughs> can get you across the country on a nonstop flight. Or even if you have to stop um, and change planes <laughs> in Dallas, which I often have to do, um, much as I despise it. But anyway, nothing personal Dallas, but that airport yikes <laughs> but anyway um the new uh uh golden motel mystery is real it's set in california and um i describe it as hacks meets schitt's creek um <laughs> my husband and i were were early adopters of schitt's creek because we we're big S uh sctv fans and the minute i saw like eugene levy and Catherine O'Hara, was like i don't care what they're doing i'm there so before it really you know when you were on this little pop tv whatever that was we got into it and um and so my protagonist is a burned out sitcom writer <laughs> <laughs> who could that be who um <laughs> impulsively buys a motel um in uh gold rush country she stumbles upon she's gone up there her her mom passed away like six months ago unexpectedly and her dad is a voice actor who was traumatized by the loss of his wife you know and um yeah. and she's been her career has been on the downside she's on a um a, a terrible kids sitcom called duh which is on the kids <laughs> channel and and doesn't remotely experience uh re, re uh, uh recall my experiences working on a couple of disney shows <laughs> um so uh so she ends up in she goes to the gold rush country to kind of escape and um she falls in love with this little mid-century rustic you know redwood motel and impulsively buys it with her best friend jeff who also was her brief former husband and she's actually divorced twice she's pushing 40 um and one of the motivating factors is she finds out and this is true that at 40 you are eligible for the writers guild career career longevity committee so um at 40 you're already looking you're as as we say the business you're heading to the barn uh career-wise <laughs> so that kind of like inspires her to look for an alternate um and so then but it's it's a little town is called found gold and it's next to a bigger town not much bigger called gold's gone um which is a restored miners village and is inspired by the first on my first trip to california my great aunt molly and uncle howard had moved from brooklyn to modesto where uncle howard um ran a tomato packing plant and i went to visit them and molly took me to columbia state historic park um which is a restored miners village and people dress like pioneers and it just really i just fell in love with it and um I'm not sure they'll appreciate its depiction in the book because it's a little Westworldian, um, but still it's <laughs> funny. You know, people are dressed like pioneers, but um, there's a woman there, uh, Verity Donner Gillespie, who's very threatened by my protagonist, D, because um, she's been kind of the the, the capo de capo of, um, you know, of, of Gold's Gone. Um, and, but what happens is the first guest is a, is a writer that, that Dean knew and worked with in Los Angeles and really was kind of a, he was kind of a PRICK. Um, and, mm. but she's really, really hoping uh, things he's not, um, he's changed. She unfortunately finds out he hasn't changed and he dies. And then, but his body is, uh, sh her property shares a border with the national park. 
um, Mosemity, but that's not what I call it in the book. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's called Majestic National Park. And I have to say to Californians, I cheat geography, that in reality, the two um, the two regions are separated by a couple of hours. But I thought that would be fun for the book. And because uh, then it brings in, she has to deal with park rangers and the local law enforcement. So when this, his body is discovered, so... It's a terrific book. Both of your books Thank actually you. are. Um, the next question I have for you is readers often think because you're writing fiction, you get to make everything up. But that's not necessarily true. Some of what you incorporate in your books is based on research. So can you talk a little bit about the research involved in your series? Um, we'll start with you, Ellen, because I never really thought maybe you have to consult with how crimes are investigated in a national park setting. Yes, mm -hmm. I did. And I kind of, <clears throat> I did, and I did write to that. Although, you know, I think um, I ch I cheated a little, but no, I did make sure that it, it could be, you know, it was right. And, and the thing that's tricky is that when you're dealing with the smaller towns, you know, who, where does the sheriff come in? Do they all have... Um, uh, you know, people who would research that. And I actually got in touch with um, uh, the Sonora Sheriff's Department and, and a woman there was very helpful. And um, I did research into um, the park, you know, and then also uh, just um, for me, you know, I really, Jer and I did a road trip and um, we drove up and we went, my husband, Jer, and we went to, first we stayed in Oakhurst and we went on the narrow gauge railroad. And I, cause I also know that um, Penny for Gold is part of, you know, my character resur resurrects an old sluice that's there. And in the second book, which will come out next year, Solid Gold Murder, it's about the second gold rush, which is based on the fact that we had so much rain in the spring, it actually created a second, you know, it exposed gold that hadn't been uh, seen or realized was there for years in California. Wow. And so I interviewed um, some prospectors who were, you know, whose side jobs or side gigs are running these uh, things. And then we drove to Sonora and we stayed there and um, then I went and spent time back in Columbia State Historic Park. Um, Jer dropped me off and I just ran wild and had a great time. Um, just did everything I could and we explored some of the other um, towns like you know and one thing that I realized is that the miners were very and I read as much as I could because I think it's fascinating and the right the miners were very literal about how they named things and um, which is why how I came up with found gold and gold's gone um, and what I realized when I was writing oh. the book the original thing it was like found gold was the bigger town and gold's gone was the smaller but then I flipped it because it was funnier because I realized well when they found gold they left to spend it um but <laughs> gold's gone well they were stuck there and so that's why the town the little tiny village became you know like you know st stopped in time and so then it could eventually become resurrected as a you know as a tourist attraction and historical site so um but that trip was wonderful it was really fun you know and it was weird to be back there because i had such different memories of it for my trip you know, 40 years earlier, um, you know, it was not quite how I remembered it. It was a little more, it was a little quieter. And I ran into a woman who I mentioned I'd been there before. She goes, oh yeah. And she was started, she had started a store there. She goes, yes, I want to bring it back to what it was then because it was much more lively then. So that was interesting. Yeah. Archery, what about you? I'm fascinated with your books because we learned so much about the fashion, costume, movie business, Things like I never really knew that when they're purchasing fabrics for um, vintage films or historical films that they have to age them. I never thought about that. Oh, yes. Yeah. So that it doesn't look like it's, you know, and brand then, new right off the bolt of fabric. And same with clothing. We wanted to we wanted to look authentically worn. How whatever and whatever that means in the context of the story and the character. And so that's a you know, everything from pristine if you're doing something like in Napoleon and recreating the coronation of Napoleon and Josephine, or if you're talking about a, as you if I were doing a movie about Ellen's books, you know, miners who work with sluicing and in the dirt and water all day, their clothing is going to be much different, obviously, and it's going to look much different. They wear the, the same, well, it, and it depends. Historically, they would wear the same things almost every day because it was much more difficult and expensive to 
both make and buy clothing in historic times than it is these days. It's much, it was much more labor intensive now that everything is machine made and you have fast fashion and all that stuff. Um, but yes, so you have to, the clothing, we hope that's our, that's our goal in costume design is to make sure that the clothing supports the characters, both in terms of their personality, but also their station in life, whatever is going on in their lives at that point in time. And certainly the, to, so that it's depicted histor in a historically accurate way. Um, yeah, so all of that is, it gets figured into not only the, the planning stages of the labor for the film, but also the budget, because it's, you know, those people who do all of that aging are, are very, very skilled artisans, and, um, and their work is very detailed and labor intensive, and they have to work with hand tools as well as machine tools and paints and dyes, and um, that's a very art, a creative artistic undertaking. Um, so yeah, uh, and m my research, you know, is 30 years of working in the feature film industry. So, um, and I'm, I apologize for the horns in my neighborhood. Um, uh, so I'm sorry, I, I'm supposed to be addressing the well, research think, in general. Um, you can go off in whichever direction you like. I think. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I've liked about both of your books is that um, you kind of channel all of that you learned over your career into these books so that people yeah. that don't know about movies kind of get a window into the process. I mean, things like the fact that there's such a hierarchy among the staff. I mean, it's not one person that does the costume. There's a whole crew oh. that's involved in that. Yeah, some days, on, and it, it grows and, and shrinks depending on what's going on in the either pre-production or the shooting of the film or size of the movie, the budget, all of that. There were days on Forrest Gump where we had a hundred people working in the costume department, like days when we were shooting the stadium, when he's doing the football run, when he's at, at the University of Alabama, uh, just because we needed so many additional people on set. Depends on, you know, if you were, fitting 500 background for a, for a scene that, you know, you, those people will come on several weeks before so they can help up the costumes and fit all those costumes because they have to be fitted and altered well before shoot day. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it, that's really a, a balance that I've tried hard to hone and hit with my books. And I think for some pe readers, it it's a better balance than others, but I wanted to give, I'd love to give readers an insider's guided tour into the world of the everyday movie set, what it's like to work on a movie set. But there's an awful lot of detail. And of course, I've absorbed it in a granular way after 30 years of working in it. So it's a matter of editing. You know, what is interesting? What can I provide the reader that I hope is interesting and possibly new information to them without, you know, having their eyes glaze over about, um, you know, the, the details of actually aging a pair of trousers to go from new to as though somebody has been wearing them for 10 years, that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's fun for me. Um, I love being able to go back and think about my career and all the things that we did and not have to actually be doing all those things. Um, although I, I mean, I loved, I loved my work. I really loved my work. At, um, it's, uh, but I worked on, I worked on the biggest movies, which also I'm grateful for, but um, those are the ones that uh, uh, come up with the most challenges. Oh, I, I will say, in Starstruck, for example, um, it's based in many ways on my experiences working on the film The Aviator. And you asked about things that really happen. And one of those uh, is occurs early in the book in Starstruck when my main character, Joey, discovers that a whole set of costumes for a particular sequence in the movie she's worked on that they believed were going to come from a vendor 
who had agreed to make them for free are not going to be delivered after all. And what happened to us on the aviator is that Bell staff, the English sportswear company, had agreed to manufacture all our World War I aviator gear for free. And then about three weeks before we were going to start shooting those scenes, Miramax, back in the battle Weinstein days, suddenly demanded that in addition to making free stuff for our movie, Bell staff should kick in a quarter of a million dollars cash uh -huh. and also sign a contract to make free costumes for three more movies sometime in the future, TBD. And Bell staff said, no, thanks. We're not going to do that. So there we were in the costume department three weeks before we were supposed to start shooting these big period scenes with no fabrics, no patterns, nobody meant to make the stuff, no time, and also no money budgeted to do it because they were supposed to be coming free for Bell stuff. So we, you know, this is what we do in film. And I'm sure it's the same for writers in TV and film. You know, you something happens like that because it's a very fluid working situation and you never know what's going to happen. You find a way to solve the problem. So that's what we did. And what I depicted in the book is very much what we did to shore up that big hole in our stock. It's a fascinating part of the story. Um, Ellen, I have a question for you. Yes. You call yourself an accidental culinary cozy writer. <laughs> you explain that and then I'm thinking but your new book doesn't have any recipes what yeah. happened there uh, well it's it does I threw in like one recipe just just for fun um because okay. I'm so you know but as my editor reminds me it's not a culinary cozy um you know I say it's accidental because what happened is like I've really never been a cook I love to bake and I think it's so interesting because it you know the process breaks down there are people who love to bake and people who love to cook and I've always loved to bake um, but I never can because I'm always on a diet. Um, my daughter, by the way, is a fantastic cook. She is the cook of the family. But um, so when I was writing uh, the Cajun Country Mysteries, I was like, I hadn't been to New Orleans in a while and, and Cajun Country, and I was really making myself hungry. And it occurred to me, well, if I'm hungry, my readers will be hungry. So maybe I should put in some recipes. And, you know, so I did some very kind of rudimentary recipes for the first book. And then it was like, oh, I'm writing a, I discovered I was writing a culinary cozy mystery. So, um, so that became what I did. And, you know, then I had a series set in a, a catering hall. Well, you can't, you know, that's screams for recipes. <laughs> and then I have a habit of collecting, which is the great irony is I'm not a cook, but I collect vintage cookbooks. I love looking at them. I love how they are, you know, so representative of their, um, the times and the time period in history that, you know, the decade they're written in. Um, but I never actually made anything from one of them. Well, again, if you're doing a series that revolves around vintage cookbooks, people are going to reach the end and go, okay, where's the recipe? Um, yeah. And what's fun with that though, is I actually got to, I get to tap into my collection and um, pull recipes. And then, so I have a, a good guideline and then I get to update them a little because it's so interesting how they're written is different. You know, there was one recipe I didn't understand at all how it was laid out. And I had to like, and someone's, and I explain, I put this on Facebook and someone said, oh yeah, that's how they wrote them back then, you know, quite often, oh. but I didn't know that. And so I had to like translate it for myself and then ingredients are, you know, some ingredients don't exist anymore or, or aren't, um, you know, readily available or, you know, ovens, you know, you have a recipe for 1930s. Well, that, uh, the way an oven cooked in 1930s is very different than how it cooks now. So, um, so that's been a lot of fun. Um, and, you know, and I feel it, it's weird. I hope people you know, don't expect, like, don't read this book. I mean, I will have a, I do have like one recipe in it and I'll probably throw on one for each book. I do have some travel tips. I call road trip tips, um, ah. that I, you know, just a couple. And I have to keep that going. Um, I, I, along the lines of the previous conversation, you know, there are, I, the trick with my series will be keeping the Hollywood or without my protect in this in the first book she actually has to go down to um to los angeles to do some investigating in the second book that's not the case so i had to find a different way to keep that part of her life av alive because my goal is to always keep that part of her life alive in some way you know even if it's um not 
a trip down to LA or something. Um, so, you know, um, there's a, a bear in, um, and I have now have a bear charm and on the back, you can't see it cause it's too small, but he's holding a little knife on the back, which I kind of love. <laughs> so I found this, it popped up on my Instagram feed and I grabbed it. Um, but you know, so that will be the trick, but yeah, there are real, you know, the interesting about the writing staff and you talk about staffs as the hierarchy is the only time a writer on a TV staff is ever called a writer is at the lowest level at staff writer. And then oh. you go to story editor, executive story editor, co-producer, producer, supervising producer, co-EP and EP, you know, co-executive producer and the EP is the showrunner. Um, and there are some, some cases that my protagonist, you know, my protagonist and ageism in comedy is, is a real thing, um, because humor wow. evolves and what made people laugh 10 years ago, 20 years ago, a hundred years ago is very different than what makes people laugh now. And, um, oh. and so you have to be like if someone wrote, wrote in order to write the joke, you have to be in on it. And so if you're not keeping your humor current, um, you and even so like i i mean i've known people who are like 70 have great sense of humor very current and people who are 30s and pitch jokes like old farts mm -hmm. so um but ageism is real and and there are moments i'll just tell i'll share one that's from the book where my protagonist says um you know she she goes i know a writer who lied about who knocked five years off her father's age in his obituary to make herself look younger well Wow. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> I and there's another one she made her daughter, you know, another writer made her daughter lie about her age on a kindergarten project. Again, <laughs> me. <laughs> I, I, my, my poor little my poor girl comes in and said, Mom, they knew they want my teacher wants to know your age. I'm like, don't tell her. <laughs> Never <it> is. <laughs> So my dream was always I would take out a big ad when I actually, you know, stop writing and like in, you know, the trades and say, this is my age. Ha, bye. But I'm never going to do that. Marcy. I know. Too funny. True um, stories. When people read the book now, they'll go, oh, right. That's her. Yeah. I love that. One of the things that I didn't realize until you had written something, Marjorie, was that costume design and storytelling are similar i never really thought uh, yes yeah i well that's that's actually why i wanted to be a costume designer as opposed to a fashion designer because i was never even though i have a degree in fashion design from fit in new york um i was never interested in what people were going to be wearing next spring i was always interested in theater history, theater, art, and books. But um, those those were my passions. And costume design really combined a lot of them and gave me that kind of, the kind of creative outlet I was I was looking for because really if we're if we do the best possible job, we as costume designers are social anthropologists. We're going back and we're uh, whether it be today and a certain segment of society or whether we're going back in time or whether you're going into the future, which is not my favorite thing to do, but I've done a few of those too. And figure which almost always, you know, you find some, some touchstone back in history that you can bring forward and transform in some way to represent the future. Or what's going, what's going on in your movie that piece of history will inform in the future but um yeah it's all about in service of well in service of the character first of all on an individual costume basis but also since the character is in service of the story all of our work is in service of the story we want to and every movie is a different world no matter if it's set in, you know, you can have two movies that are set in this, obviously, you all know this, set in the same period, but they're telling very different stories about very different people or telling them in a different way, like Poor Things, which is, you know, a, an amazing surrealistic mashup of um, so many, it, so many concepts and ideas, but I just thought, um, that they did a brilliant job 
visually with both the production and the costume design in taking elements from the period and using them in the most unexpected ways to flesh out those characters, whether you like the movie or not. Um, I just thought that this Which was movie? Brilliant. I missed that. Which movie was that? Poor Things. Oh, Poor yes. Things. Okay. I missed that. Can, John, can I ask Marjorie a question? Sure. Um, I'm curious, like, how much input do the actors have into the costume, you know, in terms of working with you? And also, is there a hierarchy there? Like, will oh, Kate Blanchett have more of an input than, you know, uh, the, oh, that's a vigorous nod. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's all about it, it's all about who has the most power and you know, and everybody has more power than the costume department. But really which is fine because we really are in service of. Um so what is wonderful about powerful actors like Kate Blanchett and like Brad Pitt and like Tom Hanks and like Dustin Hoffman and many, many others, as a matter of fact is that they are so invested in their craft and they are smart enough to realize the collaboration with the costume department is the best way to help them fully realize their characters. So if you get a brilliant actor who's like Kate, who will get down on the floor with you and look at all your research images of ballerinas from the 1940s and, and you know, speak seriously about how they can be used in the context of her character and then go through the wrecks with you, look at sketches with you. And I mean, that is the ideal process. If it's, you know, if you're collaborating, I, and because it's all a big team. I mean, the costume department is a big team in and of itself, but the whole movie, the creative departments especially are, are a big team. And if we're all working together, which almost never happens, but um, you have a better chance of working directly with the actors because we have so much personal interaction with them by virtue of fitting them in clothing. Uh, it just, it, it, it's so much more satisfying and gets you better work. So um, I don't know, I sort of talked around all of that, but they do, especially the stars, they have a lot of input. And then there are people who, you know, will say, I'm not going to say who this is, but, you know, he was in a T-shirt and, you know, jeans moving. He said, can you lower the neckline on this T-shirt because I want to give the fans what they're looking for. So you're going to do it because, because he's a big deal. You don't have to tell us, but I think you can guess who it yeah. is. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, 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 you probably have many different names in mind and you might be right, but this is one thing that I thought was, you know, interesting anyway, whether it's funny or not, it was interesting. After Final Cut came out, I started getting texts and emails from a lot of my colleagues in the in the costume community. And they, Marcus Prey in that book was this megalomaniac, misogynistic producer, director with a big deal in Hollywood and um, just a really, a really bad guy. And people would text me and say, oh, I know who Marcus Prey is, it's blank. And I look at the name and say, well, it's not, but it could be. And there were like six or seven of those and none of them, they were all good guesses. Nobody guessed my guy, but they were all good guesses, so. I guess you're spoiled for choice when it comes to villains. <laughs> Well, also good people, though, too. I mean, I mean, I really did meet and work with so the the bad, the bad people were so far eclipsed by the good. So I will I have to give a tip of the hat to our community in general. Let's talk a little bit about your writing process, because I'm fascinated by that, too. Ellen, you have written plays, you've written journeys been involved in journalism, magazine writing, and things like that, and now books. Does the process change for you from writing a play to writing a novel? You know what? Um, yeah, the thing is, in between writing plays, uh, although I did write, but the last play I wrote was like 20 years ago. In between writing plays, I did, you know, I really had a 25-year career writing TV. And, um, and so the difference between writing a novel and a play 
it was very like I was very much a pantser. I'd have some notes and then I'd let the play take me where it went. Um, but uh, my TV career really informed my writing process for my my novels in that, um, you know, uh, out, an outline is part of the pay structure in TV and film. Like you cannot move on to script until your outline has been approved by uh, multiple levels. You know, either if you're working in TV, showrunner, studio, network, um, if you're working in film, the producer, you know, the director. Um, and so uh, I became a real, I, I outline um, and I write about a 30 page single space outline. I even do it by chapter, but I call it a fluid outline because um, I will just, uh, you know, as I'm writing some, I've had, you know, there's a character in my catering hall mysteries, Terry Fuoco, this reporter who becomes uh, both a, fr a frenemy, like a, a, a kind of a friend, but also a thorn in my protagonist's side. She wasn't in the original outline for the first book. I was halfway through the draft and I thought, mm, my character needs a nemesis, but not like, you know, a, a different level of nemesis. And so I created Terry. Um, and because it's a fluid outline, you know, I had that, I mean, I like to know the bones. I, I really do. And so um, it, it just gives me a comfort factor and then I can play. And what I've realized is someone said this to me once when I was doing an outlining workshop, said, oh, so your outline is like your first draft. And um, that's really very true for me. So, um, and it's, it's, uh, I just finished a short story that actually is going to go in a co collection called Hollywood Kills. Um, and it's- mm. It's um, uh, it takes place in in the Wilder Building on Paramount, um, which where I spent five seasons, and I had an outline. I was really stuck, and I had an outline so much, so I did have to. I had an idea where it was going. And I did have to pants a little, but it wasn't fun for me. It's more fun for me to know, you know, to like have the bones very, you know, and have a lot of detail. Sometimes, sometimes I'll have like sections of dialogue. I can just cut and paste and put into the novel if I've really gotten on a run when I'm breaking the outline. Um, so it's a security blanket in a way, but it's come in handy because when uh, my writing partner, my TV writing partner, I had a partner for most of my TV career, um, we were known as strong first draft writers. And mm -hmm. um, which is, what you want on a show because especially in a sitcom and especially in a multi-camera show where the production schedule can get so far ahead of you because you've got multiple trains running you've got an episode of pre-production you're trying to break stories for the next production you're in production you know you have to do a, a rewrite on the one that's going to go to the table next week um and i think my outlining process helps me be a strong first draft writer for my novels what about you, Marjorie? How do you approach writing your books? My writing process, it starts out especially very much like my design process because I start with um, inspiration boards. I start by collaging images that I find resonate with me and I think are going to help me develop my ideas into a cohesive piece of work. Um, and I keep those boards up and they provide me with creative a creative backdrop and and stimulation throughout the process of writing the book but obviously then i need to get words on the page and i too am an outliner um i and my outlines are usually about 25 pages long but and and fluid because um i think of the outlines almost like the shot list for camera setups on a movie. Um, and the whole time I'm writing the book, I have the movie version playing in my head because I, I have learned that if I can't visualize a scene, if I can't be seeing it as I'm writing it, I can't write it. So, I'm going to jump in here just for a sec, because what you yeah. said is so, uh, I think because of our backgrounds, I realized we're, I'm very visual. I didn't, and I have to see it in my head yes. too. And in fact, after the Witless Protection Program, when I, when it came out, I wrote to my agent, I said, I think this is a screenplay masquerading as a novel. So we shared that in common because of I our background. Thought that, I thought that reading your books too, Ellen, I thought, you know, that because you paint such vivid word pictures. Um, I can see the places, I can see the people, and um, yeah, I can see that in your books. And it makes same, sense. same with but yours. I can, it makes sense. No, you know, since I know your background, I've never, I never thought, I never really connected it uh, specifically. But just when you said that, I'm like, well, of course, that that's exactly right. Yeah. 
My next question for you is both of you have been kind of folded into the cozy mystery writing su mystery writer subgenre. And what's interesting to me is cozy is kind of having a renaissance. I mean, there's not just cozy mysteries. Now there's cozy fantasy. There's cozy romances. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. How my question, my dual du duet question, I guess you'd say, is how do you define cozy and why do you think it's so popular with readers? especially right now. Um, so I think cozy based at this, you know, with books, it's like, there's usually, an, there's an amateur sleuth. It's always an amateur sleuth. Um, and it's, uh, you know, there isn't gratuitous sex violence or bad language. And I always say for me, it's not a political statement. I just can't write those things. Um, and uh, I think there's a, it's comfort food. And I don't think there's anything wrong with comfort food. And I feel like the genre doesn't get the respect it deserves um, within our, even within our own mystery community, you know, it's just kind of, kind of dismissed a little bit. Um, and, but when you look at like, you know, only murders of the building or poker face, yeah, mm -hmm. occasionally they mm -hmm. curse or something, but it, it, at their hearts, um, they're, they're cozy. Um, and so, you know, I think the comfort food factor, the fact that, you know, you, I mean, I I don't want to read about a tortured, murdered teenage girl. I have a daughter. I can't go there. I don't want to be haunted. I don't want to be heartbroken and saddened. I just read to escape. And I think um, escapism is is uh, undervalued, you know, in our culture. I also think humor is undervalued. You know, we give way more, you know, gravitas to what makes us sad than what makes us happy. And, um, you know, I don't understand that, but it's a fight I keep fighting for cozy parody with other genres for, you know, and it's really hard to write humor, you know? Oh my gosh. It's so, so I mean, like, you know, when you're there and it's four o'clock in the morning and you're trying to get a script ready and you have to be funny, I dare anyone not to tell me that's like one of the hardest things in the world to do. Uh, Marjorie, I'm talking too much. You step, you jump in. No, 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 you're not. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. But no, no, I, I am. Uh, because I, can, I don't, uh, I can come up with some, you know, humorous stuff, and but I can't write like you can. I can't write humor like you can. And it, I do. I just, I'm in awe. And I thought you articulated the whole situation so beautifully, because especially at this point in time, in our world, I think people are looking for places where they can go and feel okay for a while. Yeah, because uh, it's a it's a big, uncertain, scary time out there in lots of ways. Um, but uh, and we did and at my it may, I, I thought it maybe it had, was a function of my age too. It used to be that I and I still revere films like The Killing Fields, mm -hmm. but that's not what I want to watch when I have five, you know, time to sit down and, and watch a movie. And that's not what I want to read anymore either. Uh, I want to read something that is going to make me calm down and just uh, relax for a while. Well, and, and look and at how- think, so And think, and I think, mean, and think. But look how successful, well, cause you know, solving a puzzle, you know, I always say that I, I Exactly. shorthanded for right. myself i was going to say how but then i'll get back to that but how successful like ryan johnson has been i mean you know with um the the uh benoit blanc movies the glass onion and um dives out Excellent. i mean those came out of nowhere i i went to a screening um the writers guild is a notoriously tough crowd uh oh, those screenings they can get they can get and so I went to a screening of the, you know, of both movies and even the first one, which no one knew anything about. And, and yeah. really it was packed and people loved it. Um, and same with, you know, the glass onion. I mean, we, I think my husband and I had to sit separately at the screening. So there's a, a huge appetite for exactly what you're saying, you know, and I, and, and, and I think people like the puzzle aspect, you know, yes. look how popular puzzles were doing during the COVID. Yeah. Um, you know, it was a shorthand for myself because I did write one suspense, which is, you know, moldering with my agent. Um, and I will get it out at some point. But it's like, you know, for me, it's like mystery is what happened. Suspense is what's happening. And thriller is what might happen. Um, and so I that's how I shorthand it for myself. And I think um, the puzzle aspect is is very 
all encompassing, you know, um, I do wish we could draw in more younger writers. Um, you know, my daughter is 24 and she's, I, I was going to raise a reader, you know, if nothing else, I was going to raise a reader and I did, God bless. Um, but you know, they grew up on Harry Potter. So, uh, they're, they kind of default to fantasy and then also the hunger games. Um, so, Oh, dy yes. so, so dystopia. And so I really, you know, I'm hoping that some of the TV projects, but even now it's like they go dark. Um, but I think as you get older and I'm not saying senior citizens of which I probably came to be one and my Metro card from when I go to New York says it in big black letters, senior citizen. Uh, you know. It's, that was a little jarring. Um, but I think, you know, as you get like in your late 20s and early 30s, you are looking for maybe a little stepping away from, you know, the dark dystopian, you know, yes, it's a horrible world and you want to escape it, not dive into it a little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the thing about cozy. It, it, no matter what's going on and people get killed at the heart, everybody's yearning toward the good, yeah. yearning toward community and helping each other. And, and the thing is, that's very, so interesting. very attractive. Yes. And the other thing about it, it's so interesting because Agatha Christie is seen as kind of the flag bearer for that, but she is really much darker. Yeah, she's And, more traditional. and yeah, then Yes, people give her credit yeah. for, I mean, Crooked House, what a dark book. You know, a lot of her books are very dark and she also very slyly funny, um, you know, Yes. so, but, you know, I, 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 it makes me sad when even cozy writers want to go, but, but, but. You know, it's like step away from like like it's a a, a scarlet letter almost. My next question for both of you is uh, um, comes because you're experts in your field, and I'm kind of interested in the case of Marjorie. What are some of your favorite classic films that you would go back and watch Mm -hmm. again and again? And Ellen, what are your favorite television sitcoms that you think hold up? Oh my gosh. Well, Ellen, you start and that'll give me a chance Um, to think you know, unless you want me to go first. I think uh, I am always a fan of of uh, a show that manages to make women funny in different ways without making them clumsy. And um, I give a lot of credit to uh, The Big Bang Theory, which is it does a magic, terrific job of making um, like I'm thinking is it six primary or six or seven primary characters funny in six characters in different ways um, and women funny in different ways. Um, Friends did that too, to an extent, um, but I feel like Big Bang really did it in, in, in very different ways. Um, and I also, I like hard jokes a lot. Um, I think I love Veep, um, you know, it's it's funny because nobody is like it's like it, it's it's appalling people are all miserably unlikable but it's it was kind of like succession which was so much fun to watch even though you just couldn't bear these people um but you know so i really love those two shows you know and and some of like my you know often like seinfeld is on and in you can see where it's dated a little Um, you have to be careful of, of shows that date. But what's interesting is that um, Wings just never seems to go away. Yeah. Even when Yeah. I was working on the show, Yeah. there were all these jokes because it was just starting to be in reruns and it was on USA. Either, every show was doing, oh, Wings, we they, we keep a list of the shows that were making fun of us for being ubiquitous. Um, but I'm telling you, people, when I mention I work on that show, people's eyes light up. Um, for the younger generation, it's it's fairly odd parents that makes me the coolest kid in the room. And I'm going to I have I'm about to sneeze. <laughs> Sorry, that's Marjorie, it. Bless your you. your turn. Oh, and Will Well, and Grace. I. I'm sorry. Uh, I oh, oh oh, just let Oh. me jump in. I love Will and Grace because you know what? When that show, it was one of the few shows that when they resurrected it, they rebooted it. It was like time stopped. Yeah. It was like the same exact. Even I don't. It didn't even look like the actors had aged. It was just like they had picked up right where they left off. So they did a really good job with that. I thought. Sorry. Go on, Marjorie. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. Um, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't think my answers are going to be very interesting, but, um, I mean, I, I love the classics. Casablanca, anytime that movie comes on, I may not sit and watch the whole thing, but if it comes on a TCM, I'll like turn it on and I'll watch it for a while. And sometimes I get hooked in 
continue watching it. I just, I think it's, it's brilliant, uh, obviously. Uh, I love The Wizard of Oz. Um, I must have seen it 100,000 times, but uh, I, it's just a sentimental favorite. And it's a really, I mean, obviously it was a groundbreaking movie at the time and uh, still very, very watchable. Um, I love almost all of Alfred Hitchcock, the mm -hmm. classics. I love Rebecca. I love The Birds. I love North by Northwest. Um, gosh, I love Breakfast at Tiffany's. I, uh, you know, um, I'm going to jump in and, and throw Preston, yeah, please, Sturg please. Preston Sturgis in. into the mix. Oh, yes. Preston yeah. Sturgis yeah. is so interesting because, you know, he kind of like, you know, I talked about how comedy ages. His writing is so specific to a period that it's almost like a, a historical lesson, but it's it's still funny. And it's I just love what he does with words. My one of my favorite lines ever is from the um the Lady Eve, mm -hmm. uh, when Henry oh. Fonda walks into the the cruise ship, you know, dining room and Barbara Stanway says, Every Jane in the room has given him the thermometer. <laughs> <laughs> You, I could not write that line now, but it is a time capsule of four of the forties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, well, when you said Eve, that like brought me to another classic and one of my favorites, all about Eve. Oh, I mean, I, I love that movie. Um, yeah, I, uh, I love Robert Altman. I love Nashville. Oh, I always yeah. will. I love um, uh, McCabe and Mrs. Miller. I mean, um, oh my God. Uh, Sydney Paul, I'm, I'm a sucker for Tootsie. I still love that That's movie. Great. Um, gosh, there are so many, so many super great movies. And you know, one that I worked on that I'll, I'll, I'll always watch a little bit if it comes on is Wag Dog. Uh, with a screenplay by David Mamet, oh, I yeah. just, I, I think that's such a, a, a and the characters in it. Uh, um, uh, Dustin Hoffman as the producer, and Alan Arkin. Uh, it's just, it's, a, it's a great movie. Um, it's a good range. You've given us a lot of choices if we haven't seen any of them. Much. Well, I sort of fumbled around, but you know, it's just like. There are so many wonderful movies. Um, I'm going to throw in yeah. one of my all-time yeah, favorites. Please, please. Which is, I've already said Preston Sturges, but Amicord, Fellini. Oh, oh my gosh, Fellini. <laughs> See, I don't even, I, I don't even remember all of the giants. I mean, yeah. Well, that movie, oh, yes. my mom was, was Italian and born there, came here when she was three. So that movie w rang so true to me. But again, it was his gentlest, funniest movie. So yes, yes, yeah. And everything you oh. named is, and you know, is a classic. It like doesn't yeah. age. Yeah. Oh my God! One that it, I, I have to gird my loins if I'm going to watch it. But Sophie's Choice. Oh, oh my God! That is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's amazing. Yeah. But what I can't believe, and it is amazing, is we've already run through all of our time. It's just flown by. So before we have to leave, can I ask each of you to remind us again about your latest project and how readers can learn more about you? Are you on social media? Ellen, do you want to start? Yes. Um, well, uh, let's see. Wind and Dine is is uh, uh, the last vintage cookbook, um, but the new one will be out, uh, A Very Woodsy Murder will be out in July and Witless Protection, oh, I'm knocking my stuff over. Witless Protection <laughs> program is out right now. You can buy them all at, at Poison Pen um, or pre-order. Um, and uh, I'm on ellenbyron.com. Please sign up for my newsletter. I, I love doing it and I often run contests. And I'm also on uh, social, on Facebook as Ellen Byron Marie DeRico for my author page and Instagram is the same, Ellen Byron Marie DeRico. And I love your newsletter. Oh, you're so sweet. Thank you. Marjorie, what okay, and My two books are Final Cut is the first one. Starstruck is the second one. Fabulous and covers. Please, 
Yeah, didn't they do a good job with the covers? They're the Hollywood Mysteries with featuring key costumer Joey Jessup. Please order them through Poison Pen. Uh, my uh, website is marjoriemccann.com and all my social media is stuff on there. And I have a little newsletter you can sign up for if you go on my website too. I want to thank both Ellen and Marjorie for joining us today. And thank you for tuning into another virtual author chat at the Poison Pen Bookstore. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much.